All right, today we are covering chapter two in the book, which details the cells and tissues of the immune system. Now, what I find really fascinating about the immune system that unlike a specific organ like the heart or brain, as complex as those organs may be, the immune system is unique in that it takes place and acts uh, everywhere in the body, okay? Um, and of course, that makes sense. We, we need the immune system to act at any point where a foreign substance might both enter and then also land and end up in the body. Um, and so the immune system sort of is made of both different tissue systems and cells that originate in all parts of the body, that originate in one place like the bone marrow and then migrate and reside kind of permanently in other areas of the body um, or ones that remain in circulation at all times. And it's really all these cells working in harmony with one another and all the different fascinating roles that they play that make the immune system work the way it does. Now, the reasons for that is that there's a number of challenges that are posed to the immune system. Okay, like I just mentioned, the immune system has to be able to respond rapidly to foreign substance that can be introduced at any part of the body. Okay. Um, furthermore, for the adaptive immune system, there are actually very few lymphocytes, which we'll talk about shortly, um, cells specific to the adaptive immune system that respond to any one antigen. In fact, you might only have anywhere from one to 10 cells in the entire body. Your body has trillions of cells and only one or 10 of them might respond to something very specific. Um, furthermore, the effective mechanisms of these adaptive immune systems, things like antibodies and T cells, have to act at sites distance from the point where either the response was induced or and where these cells were uh, created. All right, so I even just mentioned a few of them just now, but let's learn about the cells of the immune system. Okay, all these cells originate from a very specific type of stem cell called a, oh, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation all throughout the year, FYI. But uh, hematopoietic stem cells, um, abbreviated HSCs, are a type of stem cell that reside in bone marrow and are the precursor to two main subbranches, which are the myeloid cells and the lymphocytes. So this stem cell um, some has a trait that we call pluripotency. It can become many different types of cells, begins undifferentiated, and then depending on the need of the body or um, antigens that are presenting to it, uh, start expanding and differentiating into various types of cells. So myeloid cells can become um, many different types of cells that we've discussed in other classes you might have heard before. Monocytes, which then kind of differentiate to become macrophages, neutrophils, mast cells, dendritic cells, basophils. Um, and these are, for the most part, cells I want you to associate with the um, native immune response. Okay, we're going to get into native um, and adaptive immune responses. And so a lot of these have various functions that are even gonna cross over into the native, but for the most part, you can think neutrophils, macrophages as your native immune response. Okay, lymphocytes, for the most part, are associated with the adaptive immune response. Okay, something that we learned that has memory and we'll get into uh, extensively in this course. Um, and they can be nicely divided into T cells and B cells. Uh, and then the one sort of exception is the natural killer cell, which is kind of more part of the native uh, immune response. Um, but that's also a precursor of the lymphocyte. So there's a nice little table here on the left side of the slide to kind of give you an indication of the population sizes of these various types of cells. Um, so as you can see, they all fall under a class of leukocytes, which is a fancy name for white blood cells. And that's differentiated from red blood cells, which uh, have zero um, immune function. So on the table on the left, we have a nice representation of the various population sizes of these various cells in the blood. Um, they all fall under a category called leukocytes, which is a fancy name for white blood cells. Um, so that includes all cells that we see here on the right, even the cells that typically aren't found in the blood, like mast cells, which we'll learn are sort of non-circulating version, are counted as leukocytes. Um, you typically wouldn't find them in uh, circulation, so that's why they're not in this table. Um, but all of them fall under this category. So leukocytes include all myeloid cells and all lymphocytes, just for clarification. Now, by far the most populous one are neutrophils. We'll learn that these cells um, are always the first responders. Or that's why they're primarily so numerous. They also die very easily um, and fast, so they have a very short 
um, residence time in comparison to something like monocytes, uh, which though smaller in number, um, will get to a site of an infection a little bit later after neutrophils and then kind of expand and, um, and multiply on site. Um, so neutrophils are then followed by lymphocytes in number, and then in smaller numbers, we have basophils, we have eosinophils. Um, if you're curious on the right, why I said basophils and other cells, classic example of another cell would be is, uh, eosinophils. Um, and then monocytes, which again are circulating versions. Once they get into the tissue, they'll differentiate into macrophages. Uh, another word I want to point out are the phagocytes. So these are cells capable of undergoing phagocytosis. We'll talk about this a lot. Um, throughout the course, basically means they're capable of eating other cells. Um, so neutrophils, mast cells, dendritic cells, they all have that capability. So again, let's start getting comfortable with this technology, uh, sorry, uh, terminology, phagocytes, leukocytes, lymphocytes, um, hematopoietic, myeloid. I, I want to make sure we're, we all know what those, those mean. Now on to phagocytes. So the two heavy hitters of the phagocytic cell line are neutrophils and monocytes. And again, when we're thinking monocytes, I want us to start thinking macrophages because monocytes circulate in our tissue and become macrophages, just a more differentiated form. Um, there are lots of similar similarities between these two, okay? They're both producing bone marrow, they circulate in the blood, again, monocytes, not macrophages, um, recruited to sites of inflammation. They all act very much the same way. Phagocytosis in general occurs in these following steps. So first, they're recruited to the site of the infection. They're recognized and activated by microbes. So they kind of have to be instructed and recognize something foreign in order to activate just so that they're not flying around ingesting host tissue. They then ingest the microbe. That is the process of phagocytosis um, in which afterwards they then destruct the microbes um, through various enzymes and, and killer compounds inside them. Um, and then later, we'll also learn that they do have very important functions in the adaptive immune responses. They communicate with other cells through cytokines. These are specific proteins that act as messengers um, between cells um, to help promote and regulate the immune response. Okay, so a few key differences to help differentiate between these two different cells. Um, neutrophils uh, respond very rapidly. Okay, uh, we always like saying that they're the first responders. I, got, I want you guys again used to that. Um, What's the first responder cell line? Neutrophils, bam. Um, monocytes come then afterwards, so they respond slower. We also learned that they number um, a lot less um, compared to neutrophils. They require more steps to refine effectively because they have to differentiate first into macrophages. Um, and then lifespan is a big difference because neutrophils are short-lived and important difference is that they're terminally differentiated. Okay, they last one to two days. They're at the end of their cell line. They can't differentiate or mature into any other cell lines. Again, monocytes turn into macrophages. So they have a little bit longer lifetime because of that. Um, so they're involved in a prolonged response against foreign antigens. They can undergo cell division and inflammatory site, and they can differentiate into macrophages. So it's the fact that they can both differentiate and then multiply at the site, which makes them effective, but also uh, increases the time in which they have to act. So it's a one-two punch in neutrophils and monocytes slash macrophages. So now we've discussed some of those differences. I want to go specifically and highlight um, the various cells. So neutrophils, again, starting with this one, is the most abundant circulating white blood cell. Again, that's leukocytes. It's the principal cell type evolved in the acute inflammatory response. Again, because it's the first responder. Okay, um, Its primary function is to ingest microbes and necrotic cells through phagocytosis, hence phagocyte. Um, and it also produces antimicrobial substances in the extracellular space, so not just involved in eating things. Um, a few things that I want to highlight to recognize what a neutrophil looks like. Um, it's around 12 to 15 microns in diameter. One of the primary characteristics of the neutrophil is that its nucleus is segmented into anywhere from three to five connected lobules. For that reason, it's called a polymorphil nuclear leukocyte, just a fancy term for a cell with many different types of nuclei, okay, abbreviated PMNS. Um, another strong characteristic of neutrophil is that it, the cytoplasm contains um, membrane-bound granules. So granules are just payloads that have various 
enzymes usually involved in the phagocytic process or the antimicrobial functions of the neutrophils or other cells. And for that reason, these cells are also classified as granulocytes, okay, cells that have granules. And there's a few other cells that we talk about that have granules, these payloads, that'll also fall under this category. Um, now, some of these, these granules, specifically the specific ones of the neutrophils, do not stain very easily. Um, so that's also one of their characteristics. Oftentimes, if you don't know what cell you're looking at, so you introduce an acidic stain, a basic stain, and you see that it's still not highlighting these cells, you can guess that it's a neutrophil as opposed to basophils or eosinophils that we learned do stain easily. Production-wise, they're stimulated by granulocyte or the granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. That's what these abbreviations are, CSF um, and GM, CSF cytokines. And again, these are the most numerous cells. So adults produce more than 100 trillion of these per day. It's an insane number. So now onwards to monocytes and macrophages. So once again, the key difference between those two is in their lineage. So monocytes become macrophages and also typically where you find them. So monophage, monocytes are circulating phagocytes. So you'll find them in the blood and then they get into tissue once they're recruited there and they turn into macrophages. So both where they are, location, and then form of lineage um, in the timeline. Uh, now, beyond that, there's also a kind of special subtype of these um, called long-lived or tissue-resident macrophages. So you would have these developed at birth. They would be, and they reside in all parts of the tissue, in all parts of the body, um, with very specialized functions. And they're actually the kind of secret first responders. They're the ones that are going to respond to a foreign antigen because they're right there as opposed to neutrophils which have to be recruited and they're the ones that send out messenger proteins cytokines that recruit neutrophils and every other cell down the line in the immune response so morphology wise they're 10 to 15 microns in diameter so they can be at times a little bit larger than neutrophils um, but a key way to differentiate them is their nucleus these ones have a single bean-shaped nucleus as a pole as opposed to the polymorphonuclear uh, uh, leukocytes like neutrophils. And these ones are stimulated by the cytokines of monocyte colony stimulating factor as opposed to granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor like with the neutrophils. So this figure kind of illustrates exactly what I just described, right? So two sort of lineages of those two sub subtypes of macrophages uh, and monocytes. So in the typical most abundant form that we're going to talk about throughout this course is going to be the ones involved in inflammatory reactions and tissue repair. It just starts the bone marrow producing the hematopoietic stem cell, turns into a monocyte which circulates in the blood, and as soon as it's recruited into the tissue, differentiates into a macrophage. So think of that as the 99% of all monocytes macrophages that we're going to discuss. Then there's also the very specialized subtype that occurs in the embryonic stage during early development of a human, where a hematopoietic stem cell becomes this macrophage precursor. It circulates, and then a tissue differentiates into long-lasting tissue-resident macrophages um, that are kind of there throughout the entire life. Um, and these cells have very specific functions. Um, Kuffner cells, you might know from... Uh, that are, that are attacked during uh, hepatitis infections. Um, we have ones in the brain, in the lug, in the spleen. And as I said, the, these are the sort of secret first responders that actually recruit neutrophils. But I don't want you really thinking about that. I want you to think first responders, neutrophils, but just be aware that these are, are there. Now, monocytes can be divided into two subtypes. Okay, the first type, called classical monocytes, also known as inflammatory monocytes, are the more common of the two subtypes. Okay, they produce inflammatory mediators, as their name implies. They're recruited as sites of infection and injury. And uh, in contrast, non-classical monocytes are less numerous. They're recruited after an infection or injury has occurred, um, and they typically contribute to the repair of tissues as opposed to mediating the inflammatory reaction. Now, before I discuss how these monocytes can be identified, I'll just give a quick primer on how we discuss some of the of the molecules on a cell surface, okay? These are often called clusters of differentiation, abbreviated CD, and they're very often used to identify cells. In fact, some cells are just known by their most common CD cluster, okay? So for instance, a T helper T cell 
uh, is going to be more commonly referred to as a CD4 plus cell, which means that it has the CD4 cluster on its cell surface, or at least that's a primary characteristic of it. Um, we'll also talk about T-killer cells, which have the CD8 um, cluster, thus they're known as CDA plus cells. You can also differentiate cells that sometimes lack a particular um, notable cluster. So a lot of undifferentiated cells, for instance, like a stem cell could be called CD31 minus because it lacks that particular cluster. CD31 is also a, a synonym for the PCAM1 receptor. Um, so now knowing that, we can start discussing cells in terms of their cluster differentiation. So for instance, monocytes express high levels of CD14 and no levels of CD16, whereas non-classical monocytes, in contrast, um, are almost the opposite. They have high levels of CD16 and just some but low levels of CD14. Okay. They can also be differentiated by the chemokine receptors. We'll learn later on the chemokines or special types of cytokines responsible in the migration of cells. So classical monocytes have some levels of the receptor CCR2, whereas non-classical have high amounts of the chemokine receptor CX3, CR1. Okay. Mice, in their same analogous forms, uh, have slightly different versions of CDs and receptor molecules, but we don't need to know that right now. Now, for the most part, we don't talk about monocytes because they're a lot more interesting counterparts. They're fully differentiated state and macrophages are a lot more exciting. So that's what we'll typically refer to and discuss in this course as opposed to their monocytes, their undifferentiated form. We can identify. Now that we've discussed monocytes, we're going to talk about the differentiated forms of monocytes, which are, again, macrophages. Now, the primary function, the major function of this macrophage is phagocytosis, the ingestion of cells, okay? Uh, it could be foreign bodies that are meant to ingest those cells and then kill them, like you would with bacteria or viruses. Um, it could also be necrotic cells, damaged cells, or just cells that undergo apoptosis, the cell suicide programs of the body, okay? The fear is that if these cells were just to degrade naturally, they release cytoplasmic proteins that would induce an inflammatory response. So macrophages, are there to clean it up before it gets out of hand and just keeps things tidy. Okay, these are usually initiated by steps of um, proteins or any sort of markers that bind to the outside of these cells that then sort of instruct macrophages to eat it. They're called opsonins. Okay, opsonization is the process of just accumulating these things on the surface, um, these bound molecules on the surface of cells. So macrophages recognize opsonins that instructs them to then ingest them. Opsonins can be complement proteins that then bind to complement receptors, um, or even ones that bind to uh, IgG FC receptors. So those are both innate and adaptive functions that are involved in um, opsonization and thus phagocytosis. Other functions of macrophages, uh, they se secrete cytokines um, to enhance and recruit more monocytes and leukocytes to the point of inf inflammation. So that sort of amplifies the inflammatory response. They also serve as antigen-presenting cells, APCs. We're going to learn a lot about this when we talk about T cells and the adaptive immune response. But they basically present antigens and foreign substances to T cells. And they help activate T cells and they present those antigens, hence the name antigen-presenting cells. Um, because T cells can't recognize these antigens that are just solubilized and floating around. They have to have cells introduce stuff to them. Um, and then they can also promote the repair of damaged tissue. And we'll talk about the two different types of subtypes of macrophages that go into this. But it's involved in promoting the growth of new blood vessel growths, so that's angiogenesis, and the synthesis of collagen-rich ECM, which is the name for fibrosis. Okay, so as I just alluded to, there's two major subtypes of macrophages. M1 are the classically activated macrophages, um, very similar to the classical monocytes that we just learned about in the previous slide. They're great at promoting inflammation and killing microbes. They're killer molecules, nitrous oxide. And there's also the subtype of M2, the alternative activation macrophages that are involved in that tissue repair. We just talked about angiogenesis, fibrosis. They actually decrease inf inflammation as well. They encourage tissue repair. And uh, they use this um, metabolize, they metabolize arginine into this repair molecule 
ornithine, which has the chemical structure in the slide listed below. Now, neutrophils and macrophages are the heavy hitting cells of the inflammatory reaction. Because of that, they're kind of responsible for the generic form body reaction, um, which is the root of biocompatibility. Now we're going to get into some more specialized subset of cells um, that are involved in more nuanced reactions um, that do play a role in biocompatibility. Okay, so the first up is mast cells. Um, so mast cells are another bone marrow derived HPC cell. And when I want to, when you're thinking of mast cells, I also want you to consider basophils because they're very similar. And we'll get to basophils in the next slide. The big difference is that mast cells are not found in circulation. So basophils are kind of like mast cells that circulate and mast cells are like basophils that are um, tissue residing, okay? Mast cells and basophils, they're also granulocytes, just like neutrophils. So they have granules that are filled with payloads of enzymes. A very common one for mast cells is histamine and other acidic proteoglycans. Um, and because of that, because they're filled with these acidic proteoglycans, they can bind basic dyes, which turns them a blue color. Right? So if you had a cell and you didn't know what it was, you'd usually subject it to various dyes, both acidic and basic. If it binds basic, then it starts narrowing it down on what you think in mast cells at that point. All right? Histamine is one of their main me inflammatory mediators that are filled in these granule sacs. Okay? And you probably know the terms because of its connection to allergic reactions and how you have to take antihistamine medications in order to um, subside the effects of, of allergens. Um, and for that reason, mast cells play a key factor in allergic reactions, which is one of its main links to biocompatibility. And histamine specifically causes change in blood vessels that help promote inflam uh, inflammation. Okay. Um, one of the big antibodies that's involved in allergic reactions is IgE, stands for immunoglobulin E. Um, so these mast cells have lots of receptors that are specific to IgE. IgE will bind to an opsonin, will bind to an antigen, and then that combination of antigen and antibody will then bind to mast cells and trigger the release of its payloads. However, mast cells can also recognize antigens directly of microbial products independent of IgE. Basophils are very much like mast cells for a number of reasons. They're granulocytes, um, they bind basic dyes as opposed to acidic ones. They release inflammatory promoting proteoglycans like histamine, serotonin, also anticoagulants like heparin. Um, they have a high affinity towards IgE, so they have many IgE receptors. Um, just like mast cells, they can bind to microbes independent of IgE. Um, and again, the big difference between mast cells is that basophils circulate in blood. Okay, they actually take up a small portion of, that, of the leukocyte population that they're only about 1% of all white blood cells in the blood. Um, but nevertheless, they are not tissue residing. They are found in circulations. Now, despite that, basophils can be recruited to tissues at the site of inflammation. But I still want you thinking, if it's circulating, basophils, tissue, mast cells. And you're going to be right 99% of the time. Eosinophils share many traits to basophils. They're granulocytes derived from the bone marrow from HPC cells and they circulate in the blood. One big difference is that their granules um, contain basic proteins that bind to acidic dye. So that's the opposite of both basophils and mast cells. Um, and for that reason, they appear red in tissue sections as opposed to dark blue and purple, like you would find with uh, neutrophils and basophils. Um, Eosinophils have a specialized function in that they fight a type of parasite known as helminths, which are worm-like parasites. Um, and they're stimulated into production through the granulocyte macrophage colony stimmy factor, and then the cytokines IL-3 and IL-5. IL, by the way, stands for interleukin, and we'll learn all about that pretty soon. And now we come to dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are, in my opinion, the coolest cells of the immune response, um, maybe in the entire body but that's up for debate. Dendritic cells can be thought of as the brain of the entire immune system. Um, and the reason why they're so important and they have this sort of brain nickname, which only I give it, um, is that they're the ones responsible for bridging the innate and adaptive immune response. Okay, they can do this for a number of reasons. First of all, they have receptors that recognize microbial molecules and antigens directly. 
Okay, before I mentioned that T cells can't do this, they have to have antigen presenting cells that present foreign substances to them. Dendritic cells are the exact cell that do that. Okay, in the innate immune response, not only can they recognize microbial substances, they're phagocytes, so they have some defensive capabilities, they can eat these cells. Um, and that's in part how they actually degrade them and then present their antigens to T cells. They can secrete cytokines and other inflammatory mediators that help activate the immune system, um, the innate and immune response, and recruit more cells at the site of infection. And then just as I mentioned, they degrade those antigens and display them on their cell surface to T cells. They do that through a special class of molecules called um, class 1 and class 2 MHCs, which stands for major histo compatibility complexes. We'll learn about those in chapters four and six. But these cells, the fact that they display both classes of these molecules is a really big deal. And it makes them able to communicate to both CD8+, plus, which are the killer T cells, and the CD4+, plus, which are the helper T cells. Um, but now we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. But I just want to point out that that's really important at this point, And that's why dendritic cells are very special. There are a few different types of subtypes of dendritic cells that I like to highlight. And just FYI, these subtypes also have subtypes within them, not to confuse you. Um, usually when I say dendritic cells, we're talking about classical dendritic cells. So I always want you thinking that unless I specify one of the other two that we'll get to in just a, a few seconds. Um, these dendritic cells are the ones that capture antigens, present them to T cells, um, and that's one of the main special functions of dendritic cells. Um, and there are actually two different subtypes that drive separately CD8, which are the killer T cells, and the CD4+, plus, which are the helper T cell activations. Um, two other subtypes that we're going to talk about are the plasmacytoid dendritic cells. So this is sort of more of an innate immune function because they don't interact directly with the adaptive um, lymphocytes like T cells or B cells. And they're the, main, they're the body's main source of a special antiviral compound cytokine called type 1 interferon, right? So this is one of the body's main ways of responding against viruses, especially, or I'll say the, the innate immune response's um, primary way of fighting against viruses. The other way is through the adaptive immune response in T cells. Now, the third subtype is called follicular dendritic cells. Uh, one thing I want you to know about this is that these aren't technically dendritic cells. Um, in part because they don't have the same lineage. You have to go all the way back to um, HSCs in order to get back to this common lineage. Um, they just share a very similar morphology, so that's why they're called dendritic cells. These ones have a special function in the adaptive immune response in that they're involved in B cell activation and the development of B cells for antibody attacks against extracellular compounds. Now we start talking about lymphocytes. And just like I said in the beginning, when you think lymphocytes, I want you to think the adaptive immune system. Okay, the one notable exception would be natural T killer cells. But lymphocytes are just the class of cells derived from the bone marrow that are separate from all the myeloid lineage of cells of the other leukocytes that we discussed. Um, so lymphocytes are their own special branch and then they break down into various types of T cells and B cells which we're talking about in just a little minute. What's special about lymphocytes is that they're ex, um, specific to one specific antigen. Okay, so you might only have a few of these cells in your body, one anywhere from one to 10, that are specific to one very specific antigen. Um, and they're called upon only when that antigen is present in the body, in which case then they multiply, they mount an attack, and then they die off. Um, but unless you have that cell that's specific to that antigen, you can't fight off against that potential microbe or biomaterial or whatever foreign substance is introduced to your body. So we'll discuss a little bit of our evolution of understanding of lymphocytes. So it was first kind of understood how important these cells were when um, people with congenital or acquired immune deficiencies uh, diseases, um, they were really found to be otherwise healthy other than a complete lack or just obliteration or reduction of lymphocytes in the body. So that was the first kind of clue of how important a role lymphocytes play in the immune response. Later it's found that lymphocytes are the only cells that can be transferred from a naive individual, which is, uh, sorry, uh, from a, an immunized individual, so one that had experienced a particular antigen and has memory of that antigen. If you transfer lymphocytes to a naive animal, one that had never experienced that before, all of a sudden that naive animal has then the defensive capabilities to mount attack. It is thus 
immunized without having the antigen needed to be presented to it. Okay, so it's one way that we can transfer immunity is through lymphocytes. So that was clue number two on how um, special lymphocytes were in mounting immune attacks. And then it was in 1958 when Frank Burnett of the University of Melbourne, an Australian, described kind of the foundation of the adaptive immune response, which is um, clonal selection of cells. So it, it kind of really describes some of the things that we had known before. It was postulated that every lymphocyte was unique to a specific antigen. When cells uh, encounter that antigen or are presenting that by cells like APCs, like dendritic cells, they multiply rapidly in order to mount an attack. And even described how the cells will break off into two different types. One that is destined to fight an, off an attack, so it works and is effective immediately. And then another type, which is has a longer life, doesn't mount an attack, and is really just there to have memory. Okay, so the first time you're presented with an antigen, you need to both fight it off, it's a microbe or a virus, and you also acquire memory for that specific antigen so that the next time you encounter it, you're gonna have a much more efficient response to that antigen, um, even one that you yourself might not even realize. So now let's start talking about the specific types of lymphocytes. Okay, we'll start with B lymphocytes or B cells. So uh, a little background information, the B actually comes from the fact that scientists early on found in birds that these type of cells uh, were formed in the bursa, which is an organ specific to birds and is not found in humans, but that's how the B cell name got stuck. You can remember this, just the fact that they both form and mature in the bone marrow. What we'll find is that T cells um, form and part of the maturation process occurs in bone marrow and then later goes on into the thymus, hence T. So the three major subtypes of B cells are follicular B cells, marginal zone B cells, and B1 cells. So the follicular B1 cells are the most numerous type, and they're also the most exciting type. They have um, a couple cool characteristics. They express highly diverse membrane-bound antibodies, which is just their form of receptors. We'll find, you'll, you'll later learn that antibodies um, have very similar structures in both their effective forms, which are secreted, and their membrane-found forms, which serve as receptors. They also produce the most uh, high affinity antibodies and the memory B cells that are necessary for repeat infections. The other two cell types, marginal zone B cells and B1 cells, um, produce a limited variety of antibodies that uh, do not have the same high affinity characteristic. They're a lot lower affinity, um, can be um, up to two orders of magnitude um, in terms of affinity. Um, so they're kind of the initial response of B cells, after which follicular B cells get developed, and that's how you have memory, and that's where the exciting stuff comes out. But marginal zone B cells are found in the spleen, B1 cells found in mucosal tissues. The other primary subtype are T lymphocytes. There are many different kinds of this, and we'll cover um, just a few of the notable ones here right now. Um, but the name, the nomenclature of T lymphocytes is that they're first formed in the bone marrow, like all um, leukocytes, but then mature later in the thymus. So that's a nice sort of very summarized description of it. As we'll learn a lot later in the semester, the maturation process is a multi-step process and various aspects occur in the bone marrow, in this case, the thymus for T cells, but that's a way to help you remember where they help, where they partially get developed with that T for T cells and thymus. So the two major subtypes, I would say, are the CD4 plus helper T cells and the CD8 plus cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CTLs, which have the sort of dated common name of killer T cell. Again, not to confuse with natural killer cells or even natural killer T cells. Um, those are all different subtypes, um, not exactly related to the CD8 plus cell. But I like using the CD4 plus and CD8 plus cell. Sometimes I'll use the helper or killer T cell names as well, but just get used to all forms of the nomenclature. Um, CD8 plus T cells, um, as the name implies, are the fact that they're helper T cells, they help other cells do their jobs. They help macrophages, they're important in the development of B cells, and even in the development of the CD8 plus T cells. Okay, so they help all those cells do their jobs. Um, the CD8 plus cells are primarily responsible for killing viruses and microbes that are capable of living inside of cells. This is a contrast, by the way, of B cells that secrete antibodies that kill microbes uh, outside of cells. 
Um, another cool aspect of these CTLs is that they are responsible in killing cancer cells. And there's lots of cool research that discuss making um, CDA plus cells more effective, checkpoint inhibitors, CAR T cells, which are sort of engineered T cells, um, all responsible in killing cancer. And we'll talk about those later in the course. Um, and then there's also CD4 plus regulatory T cells. So very much similar to the helper T cells in that they have the CD4 cluster on them. These ones are not really responsible for killing anything or helping other cells do their job. They're really there to clean and stop immune responses before they get out of hand by inhibiting them. Then there's also natural killer T cells, which um, have more innate immune, fun uh, immune functions in that they inhibit and promote immune responses. So because of that, because of the low diversity, their low specificity, that they kind of act first and aren't involved in memory functions, um, I like to think of them as the analogous version of B1 cells. Now, I mentioned these terms before, naive, mature, um, activated. So I just want to clarify what that actually means. Um, so a mature lymphocyte is one that's kind of at the end of its developmental cycle. So it's ready to go as long as it's, you know, whether or not it encounters an antigen is independent of its maturity at that point. An immature lymphocyte will be one earlier in kind of the stem cell lineage that has yet to fully develop uh, from the bone marrow or T cell, in, uh, sorry, um, the thymus into a cell that's ready for action. To be naive means it's immunologically inexperienced. It has yet to encounter an antigen. So by definition, I guess all immature cells are naive because they have yet to encounter an antigen and only a mature cell can go from being naive to activated, okay? Um, now, in the naive state, lymphocytes are very difficult to tell apart unless you look at their cell receptors. So whether it's a B cell or a T cell or what kind of specific B or T cell, it's very difficult to determine unless you have those antigens specific to those cells. They're around 8 to 10 microns in diameter, and it's only after activation that you see a change in their morphology and also numbers. Okay, so like I said, you have very small numbers of specific T or B cells that are specific to a particular antigen. And once they encounter that antigen and go from naive to being activated, T cells, for instance, increase more than 5,000, sorry, 50,000 fold. B cells increase 5,000 fold. And one of the big differences, the fact that B cells, um, there's a tenfold difference there, is that B cells aren't the ones really acting on whatever microbe or antigen or, or virus that you need. It's, it's the antibodies that they produce. So B cells will produce tons of antibodies you need more numbers of T cells because T cells are the ones actually doing the work, where B cells are not. They're the ones, the intermediaries that produce antibodies. So in the naive state, lymphocytes typically live for one to three months, um, which is actually a fairly long time. They remain in this rest state, so the G0 portion of the cell cycle, if you go back to your cell biology, and it's only when they're activated that they go into the G1 phase and start reproducing. But in the naive state, they're always in the G0 state. Um, in order to remain alive, they need some kind of stimulation of their antigen receptor. So they actually require that signaling in order to survive. Um, B cells can possibly, there's some evidence that they can survive in the absence of antigens. Um, T cells can recognize self antigens, so um, compounds in the body very weakly, which is actually a good thing and helps stimulate their survival. Um, studies have shown though that even in B cells, if you remove their antigen receptors, they will die, okay? Um, cytokine is essential for their survival. IL-7 is one we're gonna see a lot that's required for the developmental and, and the survival of, uh, of both T cells and B cells, act, actually. B cells also need B cell activating factor, which is a very specific cytokine. Um, another cool trait of naive lymphocytes is that there's a state of homeostatic proliferation, where if, for some reason, if you were to lose most of the pool of your naive lymphocytes, the remaining amount of lymphocytes would then just tr get triggered, not through activation, but just be through signaling, have instructions to proliferate and maintain a sort of steady equilibrium amount of naive lymphocytes in the body. And there are actually some studies that show that if you use gamma radiation, which is a very efficient killer of lymphocytes in animals to significantly or completely obliterate lymphocyte population, and then transfer a small amount of lymphocytes from another animal into that now deficient animal, 
those naive lymphocytes without any prior instruction will then expand into what we would consider normal levels of lymphocytes. So any loss of naive cells is compensated with increased production back to that sort of homeostatic state. When naive cells encounter an antigen, they start to activate, proliferate, and are no longer immunologically naive, in which case they become either one of two types of cells, effector cells or memory cells. Okay, effector cells, as their name implies, are the cells that get shit done. Okay, um, they're responsible in help in killing cells, um, microbes, viruses, helping other cells perform their functions, um, secrete antibodies that do exactly the same thing. Um, they become larger, so morphologically they start to differentiate themselves from naive cells. They're 10 to 12 microns as opposed to being 8 to 10 of smaller naive cells. Um, some effective versions of T cells are the CD4 plus helper T cells, which help activate macrophages, um, dendritic cells, B cells into performing their functions, the cytotoxic T cells, which help kill viruses and cancer cells, um, B cells, um, also called the effector B cells, also called plasma cells, which are responsible in secreting antibodies for their various functions. Um, and the characteristics of these types of effector cells is that they're short lived. Um, they are self-renewing, but they don't continue for nearly as long as the other subtype, which are memory lymphocytes. Okay, memory lymphocytes are um, responsible for imparting the very unique trait of the adaptive immune response, which is memory. Okay, the fact that you can mount subsequent and tertiary attacks against antigens much more effectively because you have memory of them. Your body's already encountered them before, and that's sort of the basics for uh, immunization. Okay. Memory lymphocytes can survive for months or even years after a microbe has been eliminated. Um, part of that reason is that they have much higher surface uh, concentrations of the IL-7 receptors. So just as we learned that IL-7 is necessary for the growth and survival of these cells, memory cells have tons of them, so they're very sensitive to them and helps them uh, remain alive much longer. Um, and also, as you age, the population of lymphocytes of naive to memory T cells um, starts becoming a lot more favorable towards memory T cells, which kind of makes sense, right? As a newborn, you're very naive. You haven't encountered very many antigens. So at the very beginning, it's 100% naive. And as you start to reduce the production of brand new naive T cells as you age, your body kind of makes up for that because you have more experience and you've encountered a lot more antigens. So the lymphocyte population becomes much more favorable towards memory T cells. Uh, sorry, uh, memory cells in general. All right, now that we've had a nice intro to the various types of cells that we're going to encounter uh, in the immune system, we can talk about the anatomy of the lymphoid tissues, right? So the organs of the immune system. Okay. Um, so the bone marrow and thymus fall into the primary, also called the central or generative lymphoid organs. Okay, so these are the initial sites of both P and T lymphocyte maturation. Um, they function to provide growth factors, uh, molecular signals needed for maturation. So these are all, by definition, naive cells. They have not encountered any antigens. Um, uh, they function to present uh, self-antigens during the maturation process. So that's very important in, in weeding out lymphocytes that might potentially be reactive to host tissue. Okay, So it's important to note that um, uh, no foreign antigens get presented in these primary lymphoid organs. Okay, so think generative, they're the generation of these lymphocytes. Okay, usually all the magic of the adaptive immune response happens in the peripheral or secondary lymphoid organs, sites like the lymph nodes, the spleen, and also certain components of the mucosal uh, immune system. Okay, so these provide a centralized location for foreign antigens, uh, usually presented by antigen presenting cells, and lymphocytes to interact. And what we'll learn about later is that really most lymphocytes are in a constant state of circulation, um, migration back into the secondary lymphoid organs, looking for antigens, antigen-presenting cells, back into circulation in this sort of um, circulating pattern. Now, when discussing cells, we just said how all leukocytes and all the cells discussed today originate in the bone marrow, so that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, so it's a site of all cell development, um, and the initial point of B cell maturation, as we'll learn B cells later go on to the spleen to finish the maturation process.
Um, HSCs, the stem cells, reside here. Um, they're pluripotent. Sometimes I see the word multipotent float around in the book as well. Um, so that's just the fact that these stem cells are the source of all kinds of blood cells. Okay, they can't differentiate into... Okay, so they don't have an embryonic like pluripotent state where they can differentiate into brain cells or cardiovascular cells, but certainly all classes of blood cells, um, including ones not discussed here, um, like red blood cells. Um, the bone marrow can be divided up into the red marrow and yellow marrow. Uh, red marrow is where we're going to be spending all of our time. Yellow marrow is where other cells like fat cells uh, uh, reside. Um, but the red portion is where the HSCs um, turn in all the cells that, we, that we're talking about. Um, proliferation and maturation is stimulated by cytokines. Um, most various types of colony stimulating factors, CSFs, um, we've discussed a few specific ones of those, like granulocyte, um, CSFs, or um, GM granulocyte, macrophage colony stimulating factors, and other um, cytokines that help the development of these cells. Uh, and they're typically produced by activated macrophages, T lymphocytes. So these are cells that help trigger the stimulation um, and reproduction uh, from HSCs into the various types of cells um, as needed by various um, antigen or immune responses. Um, the bone marrow is also home to effector B cells, also called plasma cells, um, that produce um, antibodies that circulate in the body, and also memory uh, B and T cells. Now, the thymus is an organ that's located in the you know, upper chest area, is more prominent in birth, but kind of atrophies and gets a lot smaller during puberty, and actually becomes very difficult to detect in adults. There's not too much of the anatomy that I really want you to know. Um, I'll highlight a few things. Um, the outer cortex is densely populated with uh, very immature T cells. And as the maturation process progresses, um, you enter into the inner medulla, which um, those sparse with T cells are more in the mature range. Okay, they also contain macrophages and dendritic cells. One takeaway is that the fact that these have medullary thymic epithelial cells. So these are specialized cells during the production and generation of T cells that specifically present self antigens, so host antigens to T cells. And if T cells recognize these, that means they've been kind of manufactured, I won't say incorrectly, but the fact that they recognize self antigens is bad. And then the body has processes to eliminate them and make sure that we have to tolerance to our own compounds. Now, one little sidebar that isn't quite covered in the book is the concept of nude mice. Okay, nude mice uh, were extremely helpful in explaining the functions of the immune response because they lack a genetic coding factor that prevents the differentiation of certain epithelial cells at birth um, required for both the development of hair follicles, hence nude, they lack hair, uh, but more importantly, the development of the thymus. Okay, so these mice are healthy other than the fact that they lack a thymus. Okay, it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, this makes them unable to mount many types of adaptive immune defenses, okay? They can't produce um, really effective antibodies, okay? Those require CD4 plus T cells. They can't mount any cell-mediated immune attacks, okay? So any viruses or bacteria that live inside cells that require cell-mediated attacks um, usually require CD4 plus or CD8 plus cells for those functions. They display no types of delayed type hypersensitivity responses, which CD4 plus T cells are required. Um, they can't, they're very poor at, at killing viruses or malignant cells, uh, meaning tumor or cancerous cells, which require CD8 plus T cells. Um, and they also don't have a graft rejection response, um, which requires CD4 plus and CD8 plus cells. Um, so even though they're very important in our understanding or development of understanding of the immune response, um, they've fallen out of favor to knock out mice, which are mice that have um, other various types of specific genetic deficiencies where we've, through genetic engineering, knocked down or, or knocked out those specific genes. So instead of just lacking a complete thymus, we can get a lot more specific with our experimental hypotheses and experiments through the use of knockout mice. Now, going back to the anatomy of the immune response, the lymphatic system is a system of lymphatics, which are specialized fluid-containing vessels, um, interdispersed with lymph nodes, which are more kind of organ-like um, nodes throughout the lymphatic system. 
Okay. So the role of the lymphatic system is really just transport fluids from all parts of the body um, for immune functions. Okay. Lymphatic capillaries, they're very much like blood vessels, other than the fact that they like tongue uh, tight junctions um, and continuous basement membranes. Okay. So they want to allow the free uptake of lymph, which is just a name for absorbed fluid, through one-way valves. Okay. Blood vessels, you wouldn't want to just allow the free uptake of whatever, especially foreign antigens, um, which would produce sepsis. Um, so the, uh, the purpose of lymphatics is to allow lymph to take antigens and antigen-presenting cells, like dendritic cells, into the lymph nodes, which is a centralized location for antigens, antigen-presenting cells, um, T cells, the free distribution of cytokines and messenger proteins, just junctions where all these cells can interact and elicit immune responses. So I'll cover the lymph nodes here kind of lightly. We're going to go into them in more detail in chapters four and six. Um, but the lymph nodes are where all the magic happens. So the lymphatics uh, drain fluids in and out of the lymph nodes, but it's the nodes where everything congregates and activation occurs in both B cells and T cells. So you have these nodes all throughout the body. There's about 500 of them in a typical adult. Um, and their entire purpose is to ensure that lymphocytes and antigens and antigen-presenting cells all congregate in a centralized location. Um, and rather than it being just sort of a passive draining in and out of the lymph nodes through the lymphatics, um, there's actually specialized form of cytokines, which are messenger proteins, uh, called chemokines that are really responsible for the movement of B and T cells, as well as Sorry, other migrating cells like dendritic cells in and out of the lymph nodes. So we'll talk about this. I think this is chapter four, the migrational patterns of all these cells in and out of the lymph nodes. So there's just a few things I want to hit on the anatomy of these. So we have this nice little picture here, and I'll show you a um, uh, histology stain of an actual lymph node in a little bit. Um, there's follicles, which I want you to associate with B cells. Uh, oftentimes these can be called um, B cell zones or just B zones. And then there's T zones. Um, which have the fibroelastic reticular cells and the HEVs, which I'll talk about in a second. Follicles associated with B cells um, can have germinal centers, in which case they're called secondary follicles, and these have uh, primarily activated B cells, and they stain lightly. So that's actually even depicted in the picture. You have dark ring stains and then lighter portions on the inside. So the darker centers without germinal centers are called primary follicles, and they'll have um, mature but naive B cells that have yet to be activated. Um, T cells, uh, the T cell zones, um, comprise of the fibroelastic reticular cells and the HEVs that are both con conduits into bringing um, either naive T cells into the populated zones or antigens and the antigen presenting cells. So again, we'll cover these in more detail in later chapters. So the spleen has uh, a lot of similarities to the lymph nodes, um, but the primary function of the spleen is threefold. Okay, it's to remove aging and damaged blood cells and particles. So it's a big filtration unit of the blood. Um, it initiates adaptive immune responses to bloodborne antigens, and it's also important in the development and maturation of B cells. So the anatomy can be split up into diff two different uh, pulp regions, we'll call them. So the red pulp, uh, as the name implies, is blood-filled vascular sinusoids. Um, it's important in filtering and the removal of damaged cells and any antibody-coated cells uh, that are coated by opsonins, um, which helps identifying as being fo foreign, um, as well as microbes. The white pulp region is a lot more analogous to the B and T cell zones in the lymph nodes. Okay, they have B cell-rich follicles, they have T cell zones with FRC-like cells and conduits that help T cells, antigens, and APCs all congregate in a centralized location. So all very similar to lymph nodes. So I think this chapter serves as a very nice introduction to the different T cells and their functions. I promise you we'll get into more detail in all the functions discussed in this particular chapter. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of reiterating some things here. And as we get into the more detailed chapters, we'll talk about them in more complex terms. Um, but just try and understand both the innate and adaptive roles of each cell types. I try to highlight those in each um, specific slide. Um, I like the idea of knowing what cytokines are needed for the development of the various types of cells and the, from their stem cell precursors. Um, and then also kind of understand from a laboratory function, what would you use to differentiate the different cells for, in terms of morphology, 
staining. And then if you could identify their clusters of differentiating or their antibody labeling, I think those are important as well. Uh, in terms of the anatomy of functions, I just kind of want to give you a quick introduction on those. We're going to discuss those in more detail in later chapters.